in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Christ is in our midst. A couple weeks ago in prison, I was uh, ran into an inmate that I hadn't seen in a while, and we ended up in a, a long conversation. And I happened to look at his name tag, and his name tag had a had one name which I recognized, and I know all these men by usually two names, which is uh, sometimes I know their last name, but their saint's name, and then also whatever their uh, regular name is. But there was another name there that wasn't his name that I'd ever heard, that he had ever been called before. So I said, oh, I didn't know you were named that. He said, I'm not. I said, well, it's on your tag. He said, well, you know, 25 years ago, they were processing my papers. And uh, for whatever reason, they wrote this name down. And uh, that's, the name I, that's the name they gave me. And I said, well, you try to correct it. He said, you know, every prison I go to, I try to correct it. But they just, this is the name they've given me. And... That's how they're going to have it. And so we, we laughed about it because after 25 years, it's a little bit funny and it's, a, it's an image of, in some ways of how the state operates. Um, it's also an image of what it means to be an inmate, uh, someone who wears special clothing uh, that tell you who he is and is called by a number. And the names really aren't so important in there. What is important is order. And what is important from... Uh, when you're outside, from most people's perspective, is that people are serving time for their crimes. And so who cares about a name, right? But how depersonalizing that is. How depersonalizing that is to be known by our uniform. To be, well, some of us may take pride in our uniform, but it can also be depersonalizing to be known if it's not a uniform we want to wear. How depersonalizing it is not to be known by our names and to be known by just what people see about us. And you know, uh, people look at us every day and make very quick judgments uh, based on our appearance, how we dress, how we talk, how we act. And those reactions and judgments are just cover a very bland surface of things because it is very rare that we are truly ourselves with other people. It takes intimacy and a long time to develop the relationships where we feel like we can really be ourselves. So people don't really see us for who we are. They just see us. And oftentimes, uh, especially in our society, which is uh, full of polemics, it's, they see us and they categorize us. And there's a lot of categorization and depersonalization in our society. And all of this means that we're not dealing with humans anymore. We're not dealing with our neighbor. We're not dealing with people anymore. Now we're dealing with groups. We might have the quote-unquote leftists or the quote-unquote alt-right or We might be dealing, those are political, but we might be dealing with losers or winners or all sorts of uh, different ways that we categorize people and put them into little boxes that fit, fit neatly in our minds. And of course, we, in relationship to them, we never come to know them. We never may come to know them. And maybe you've had the experience of getting to know somebody and then after a while saying, you know, you aren't who I thought you were. Usually it's you aren't as bad as I thought you were, Uh, especially for all you guys. Some of you were as bad, though. No, anyways. (laughs) The point being is that that's human nature. It's normal, it's natural, and it's something that we have to fight against. But in our society is one that is is often uh, uh, full and filled to the brim with depersonalization. To tie it to today's gospel, today our Lord sees a woman bent over for 18 years who was bound by Satan, it says. And she uh, apparently attends the synagogue and, and lives her life as someone who would have this inability to stand up and inability to really look up. 
in a way, she's an image of all of us. Uh, if you want to say that we are bent over by sin or that our eyes are constantly focusing on the ground or nowadays, I guess, our cell phones, but that she is turned down and that our Lord says in the end that this is caused by Satan. We also know of people bent over caused by arthritis and their own physiology. But either way, this makes her the person that's bent over, the sick person, the invalid. Some of the fathers say that in many ways, when you saw her, you would think she was a monster. Know how cruel children can be, you know, when they see disfigurement, they see it and they turn away and they want to know from their parents how they should respond. And oftentimes their responses seem very cruel. Well, St. Nikolai Azicha says this was the response people had to this withered up tree of a woman. And so, of course, that means there wasn't a lot of intimate relations there. It means that she was isolated. And there she is at the synagogue, and our Lord does some revolutionary things. One, he comes over and he acknowledges her presence. And he acknowledges her presence. She's not seeking him. It says, woman, come here. He's seeking her. Then it says he laid a hand on her. This is how important this is, because when we think of monstrosities or the, the people we want to avoid, the last thing we want to do is to be physically intimate with them, to actually put a hand on their shoulder, to put a hand on her deformed shoulder and say that, women, you, woman, you are loosed from your infirmities. Now, Jesus' presence to this woman was one of touch. It was one where he used his, his voice it was one where he broke into her reality, which was pigeonholed to stare at the floor, and one where he brought grace and mercy. And frankly, even if he didn't heal her, even if he didn't say, you're loosed, it still would have been quite an event in this woman's life. To have someone show love and mercy like that, the type of love and mercy that we would on if we were in that same situation. But it's even more miraculous that he also healed her. We're presented with another image in today's gospel. The ruler of the synagogue is upset with this healing. He's upset with this healing because, well, he's envious and it draws attention away from the synagogue. Now, if we think about it, we would draw the conclusion that in some way he has an idolatrous relationship with the synagogue. When I say idolatrous, I mean this because he's totally blind to this woman's situation. I mean, Jesus has to compare her situation to a donkey to correct this man, to shame him. We even bring donkeys to get water. Why wouldn't we help this poor invalid woman? But his idolatry is, is thick, and, and why I say that is because there were these rules that had to be followed. There was a structure that needed to be obeyed. There were ideas that were so important to him that he was unable to see the per people in front of him. That's what idolatry does. Whether it's idolatry of our stomachs, our clothing, our religion, uh, whatever it is, it makes us blind to the people around us. And what it makes most important is that we establish our ideology, or that we establish our point of view, and that it's taken notice of. This is so important, and this is uh, ultimately, especially coming out of our political season, this is the way people think and the way they live and it goes throughout their whole life. And idolatry is very subtle. It's very rare now that we see people bowing down to golden statues like they did in the time of Nebuchadnezzar. It's very rare where we could have the three holy youths who could reject this and say, well, that's a golden statue, it's not God. 
Our idolatry is very subtle. Sometimes it can be idols like fasting, which is something the church commands you or asks you to do. Sometimes it can be the idol of our ideology, our political ideology. Sometimes it can be the idol that people should pull themselves up by their bootstraps. And, or the idol of leave me alone. I've done enough in my life. There are a multitude of them, subtle attitudes that come out, and for us oftentimes very much more important than the people around us. And what the people around us yearn for is someone to reach out and to be comforting, to be loving. Whether it's because they're physically deformed, emotionally deformed, or because they have sins, we all desire intimacy. We all desire to be able to kind of let our hair down, so to speak, and to somehow be with other people and not be judged, not be corrected, and not have to fit into a mold. And that's ultimately what Jesus provides for this woman, and it's very offensive to the ruler of the synagogue. But it's offensive because of his idolatry. So for us as Christians, an imitation of of Christ, we have to be mindful of what we are idolatrous of and repent of those idols that we hold so sacredly. There's nothing wrong with eating, but there is wrong when you make your belly the God. There's nothing wrong with fasting or the church or any of these things which we set up or even our political points of view. There's nothing wrong with that. It's only when we exalt them above other people in order to categorize and condemn and depersonalize them that they become problematic. Like Christ, we need to be the presence of healing in other people's lives. This always is going to involve humbling ourselves, reaching out to touch others, to speak to them, to be with them in their suffering, to listen to them, And ultimately, this is the challenge of the Christian life, to be Christ-like, to be like Christ was for this woman and so many other people in the New Testament as we see in his living example. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, Christ is in our midst.